If you have access to a Bible, I invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is in the New Testament, which is the back part of your Bible. And uh, sometimes if uh, you're sort of new to studying Scripture, some of these books sort of get a little confusing. I'll help you out a little bit. You know, the first four books of the New Testament are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, they all tell the story of Jesus. And then after that, you have the book of Acts, which is uh, also written by Luke, the, the author of the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a long book, and Acts is a long book, too. And uh, I guess Dr. Luke liked to write a lot. And so uh, in the book of Acts, uh, you have the story of the early church. It's really the acts of the Holy Spirit uh, working through the apostles in the early church. And so uh, the book of Acts is followed by a group of about 13. There's 13 letters by the Apostle Paul uh, that he wrote to various churches. And the first one there after Acts is Romans, and then First and Second Corinthians, and then you have a group of four books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Colossians is the book that we're in. And if you sort of get those four books, they're, sort of, they're a little bit smaller. Uh, if you get them mixed up, you can just remember this, GE Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Now, I know GE is not a power company, but now you'll remember where Colossians is. You know, you find, find any one of those, you'll know where it is in relation to the others. So, uh, we're in the book of Colossians, chapter 1. I'll be reading from the... Uh, Christian Standard Bible, a fairly new translation that I like a lot, and I invite you to follow along in your Bible or on the screens behind me. Uh, when you found Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, I would invite you to stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, this is what we read. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Father in heaven, I pray that you would grant us wisdom and understanding today as we study your word together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Now, everything from verse 1 to verse 14 is really part of the uh, same expression of th thanksgiving that Paul had for the church at Colossae. Colossae is a town in modern-day Turkey. Paul, at the time, was uh, very likely in prison in Rome, uh, quite a long ways away. And so he's writing this letter. In fact, as we learned last week, he, he didn't even start this church. An associate of his did, named Epaphras, and we'll get to him in a second, um, but really, verses 1 through 14 all make up one group. And we should have read all of this together. In fact, what we should have done is last week, my sermon should have been from verse 1 all the way to verse 14, and it would have been about an hour long. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, it wasn't an hour long? It sure seemed like it was an hour long. And uh, no, it wasn't. I decided that two 30-minute sermons produces a better congregational attitude than one one-hour sermon. And so uh, we are in Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14, and Paul does something a little strange in these verses. He takes some of the themes in verses uh, 4 through 6, verses 3 through 6, really, and he repeats these themes in verses 9 and 10. Let me show you what I mean. Up on the screen, you, you see that in verse 3, he says, when we pray for you. In verse 9, he says, we haven't stopped praying for you. You see the same theme there. 
Verse 4, he says, we have heard of your faith. And then in verse 9, he says, since the day we heard this. In verse 6, he says, the gospel is bearing fruit. And then in verse 10, he says, you are bearing fruit. And so what is, what's Paul doing? Why is Paul repeating himself? I mean, is he getting, getting a little old, you know? Or is that the problem here? Uh, or, or maybe, maybe the Colossian Christians just, they weren't that bright. You know, they had to be told something twice in order to figure it out once. You know, maybe that's it. No, it's not either of those things. Uh, Paul repeats these themes on purpose, and I'll tell you why. By repeating certain things, it actually emphasizes something new that you say. And you might say, well, what do you mean? Well, I'll show, show you. Has your wife ever had to tell you more than once that the trash needs to go out? Not at all, right? I'm not talking about once a week, okay? I'm talking about the same trash that needs to go out. Honey, the trash needs to go out. Uh-huh. Honey, the trash needs to go out. Uh-huh. Sweetheart, after you take the trash out, I have a surprise for you. Oh, I heard you this time. Me like surprises. Me take trash out. So men are a little slow to get it sometimes, right? But you see, a little bit of repetition of the same thing makes the new statement stand out. And that's what Paul does here. And uh, he says some things in verses 3 through 6, and he repeats the same themes in verses 9 and 10 in order to help us pay attention, pay attention to the big idea. And the big idea is this, and you can see how big it is because the words are so big on the screen, right? We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. See, that's the big idea. Everything else that Paul mentions is thanksgiving. But now, with this statement, this is what Paul wants Christians to do. This is what he wants us to do. Be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Here's the deal. Sometime before, a guy by the name of Epaphras, one of Paul's associates, took the gospel to the people that lived in Colossae. In other words, when I say took the gospel, that's a very churchy way of saying he told them about Jesus Christ. And what Epaphras told them was that Jesus is God in the flesh. He told them that Jesus lived a life without sin. He told them that Jesus died on a cross to pay for their sins, pay the penalty for their sins. He told them that Jesus rose from the grave. He was resurrected from the dead. He told them that Jesus ascended to heaven as Lord over all, and he told them that Jesus is going to return someday to this earth, and he's going to return as judge and as king. Now, just like many of us in this room, there were some people who heard that message of Jesus Christ, and they believed in the message. They believed in the good news. They believed in the gospel. And so they received Jesus into their lives, and here's the question. So now what? What do I do after I begin following Jesus? What do I do after I receive Jesus into my life as Lord? Here is what you do. You need to become who God designed you to be. That is what you do. Well, how do I do that? You do that by continuing to learn and understand 
the full extent of who God is, what Jesus did for you, and how to live in the Spirit. This is a journey, a spiritual journey, that you will take for the rest of your life. You see, every single one of us who has received Jesus Christ will face the temptation of trying to grow spiritually apart from Christ. For example, there are many Christians who have received Jesus Christ and they quickly become deceived by New Age teachings. Now there's nothing new about New Age teachings. It's just Eastern mysticism repackaged and promoted by people trying to make a buck. They tell you to engage in nonsensical activities such as become one with yourself. That phrase has no meaning. They tell you to get in touch with yourself. What does that mean? They tell you to get inside yourself. That's a trick right there. Um... All those phrases have no actual meaning. They're just intended to make other people feel like the person saying them is both wise and empathetic. And then, of course, they, they, they may try to get you to purchase healing crystals. And, of course, you can purchase them on their website for the low monthly cost of $24.95, credit card required. Or they tell you that in a past life, uh, you were Cleopatra of Egypt. You know, it's funny how the people that believe in reincarnation, they, they never tell you that you used to be a frog. <laughs> you know, you were always somebody famous, somebody wise, somebody wonderful. And by the way, if uh, you are a Christian and you believe in reincarnation, this sermon is for you. It's not for anybody else. It, it is for you because it's foolish. Reincarnation is not taught in the scriptures. You, don't, you do not need to seek personal fulfillment in some fantasy that you were somebody important in a past life. Guess what? If you're a Christian, you're, you're important in this life. You're a child of God. There's nothing more important than that, than being that. That's all you can ever be. And there's nothing greater that you could ever be than a child of God. So why do some Christians turn to things like New Age teachings? It's because they don't pursue the knowledge of God's will as revealed in the Scriptures. And in their emptiness, they turn to cheap counterfeits that leave them emptier than before. Likewise, some Christians become deceived by Scientology. They see a commercial on TV or at the bookstore, they come across some book called Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health by L. Ron Hubbard. There's a picture of that book. And you may be wondering if I'm against Scientology, if I'm against Dianetics, which I am. Why am I showing you a picture of the book? Well, I'm not promoting it. But I want to uh, answer the question that all of us have wondered who've seen this book. Why on the front cover of a self-help book is there a picture of an exploding volcano? I'll explain it. There's a reason for it. And some of you, by the way, have this book in your bookshelves. Now, I'm not a big fan of burning books because the book that has been burnt and banned more than any other book in the history of the world is the Bible. And I'm certainly not a fan of burning or banning it. But I would just warn you that uh, this book here is an introduction into the cult of Scientology, whether you realize it or not. And the danger may not be for you. You may have it on your book, as uh, uh, some of us may have other books on our shelves that we don't believe in. But the danger may be, should a, a grandchild of yours, for example, ever come across it, they might be more easily deceived than you. So just be careful there. Um, but I, I, I would venture to guess that most of us do not know what Scientology actually teaches, and you certainly won't find it in the introduction to their book, except on the cover. Here's what Scientology teaches. Scientology teaches that 70 million years ago, an alien named Xenu brought billions of alien beings to Earth. 
And when these alien beings became too populous for Xenu to control, he gathered all of the psychiatrists of the world, and he used all of the psychiatrists to gather all of these alien beings uh, together under the guise of having them undergo income tax inspections. I'm not making this up. Then, Scientology teaches, he par- this alien Xenu paralyzed them. He loaded them onto DC-8 airplanes 70 million years ago. And he placed them around the bases of volcanoes all over the planet and dropped hydrogen bombs into the volcanoes. The aliens' bodies were destroyed, and Scientology teaches that they became disembodied souls called Thetans. And these disembodied Thetans were then forced to watch a 3D movie for 36 days straight. And now, today, Scientology teaches that every single person has an alien disembodied soul called a Thetan inside of them that only Scientology can extract, of course, after the so-called Church of Scientology extracts all of the money out of your bank account. That is what Scientology teaches. By the way, did I happen to mention that before L. Ron Hubbard founded Scientology, he was an author that specialized in fantasy and science fiction stories? Now, Scientologists don't tell you they teach all of this nonsense when you first show interest in it. Dianetics is presented as a self-help Why do some Christians turn to Scientology? Because they're deceived. Why do Christians turn to self-help books at all? Because they don't pursue the knowledge of God as revealed in the Scriptures. And in their emptiness, they turn to cheap counterfeits that leave them more empty than they were before. Likewise, many Christians turn to various clubs and groups, societies, with ties to the occult. But these Christians lack discernment, and they allow their desire for friendships in these clubs to open their hearts for deception. These groups will hide from their newcomers the fact that they borrow many of their teachings and practices from the occult, just like the Gnostics did with the Colossian Christians in the second century. These groups, they don't deny the existence of God. They simply promote the lie that all religions point to the same God. These groups don't deny the Bible. They simply promote the lie that the Bible is but one of many holy books that lead to God. These groups don't tell you that you have to give up your faith in Christ to be a part of them, but they promote the lie that their teachings are compatible with the Christian faith. These groups promote the lie that salvation is found not by the grace of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and by having faith in Him, but rather through hidden knowledge that only they can reveal. These groups promote the lie that says that their secret knowledge Freeze the divine spark within humans, allowing the human soul to return to the divine realm of light to which it belongs. Why do Christians turn to groups such as these, which teach lies about Jesus Christ, lies about God the Father, and lies about the Holy Scriptures? It is both because of some unmet need for friendship as well as the fact that these Christians don't pursue the knowledge of God's will as revealed in the Scriptures. And in their emptiness, they turn to cheap counterfeits that leave them more empty than before. Christian, listen to me. After you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, you are to pursue the knowledge of God's will. Will, 
How do you do that? You must read God's Word, the Bible, if you can read. You must come to church and hear God's Word taught, if you can hear. You must make the Word of God an integral part of your life. And then the Holy Spirit will give you all wisdom and spiritual understanding as you immerse yourself into God's Word. You don't need cheap counterfeits to help you put your life together or to give your life meaning. Why? Because Christ is sufficient. God's Word is sufficient. The Spirit of God speaking to you through His living and written Word is sufficient. And all of the counterfeits of the world will leave you empty. They will mislead you into error. But if you will immerse yourself into the Word of God with the Holy Spirit as your teacher, look at what will happen in verse 10. So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Christian, if you have an ounce of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will want to live a virtuous life that is worthy of your Lord and Savior, wouldn't you? You want to be pleasing to your Heavenly Father, don't you? You want your life to bear fruit in every good work because that fruit is the proof of who you are. You are a child of God. You want that, don't you? You do this by growing in the knowledge of God. See, you might wonder, well, how? I'm still trying to figure out how do I grow in the knowledge of God? So I read the scriptures, I come to church, and I'm fellowshipping with fellow believers, and the Holy Spirit is at work in my life. But how does this happen? Because God is completely invisible. How can I grow in the knowledge of someone who is completely invisible? He is completely invisible. And our limited eyes cannot perceive him. And not only is He invisible, but God is perfectly pure. And our sinful hearts cannot embrace Him. And God is eternal. God is without limits. And our finite minds cannot understand Him. So how do we grow in the knowledge of God? It is only because this completely invisible, perfectly pure, and limitless God has revealed Himself to us that we can truly know Him. Not only did God become one of us in Christ Jesus, and He, by the way, is called the living Word of God. A word is a revelation. Not only did God become one of us in Christ Jesus, but God has also revealed Himself through the Scriptures, through the Bible, which is the written Word of God. When you and I consume In our spirit, the living and written Word of God, we grow in our knowledge of God just like a gemologist might grow in his knowledge of a diamond by using a loop. Just like a connoisseur might grow in his knowledge of a work of art by studying everything about it. But our knowledge of God is not simply academic. Our knowledge of God transforms us. It prepares us to live a worthwhile life. For the more that you understand and know God, the more you will understand and know yourself. You see, when we learn that God is our Father that speaks to who we are as sons and daughters, when we discover and really come to grips with and understand that God is our creator that speaks to who we are as made in His image. When we learn that God is holy, that speaks to who we are as unholy ones being transformed into the image of His one and only Son. Sometimes... I hear Christians say things like, well, 
I don't care about all that doctrine stuff. I don't care about all that theology stuff. Just skip the theology and tell me what I'm supposed to do. What you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to do is to grow in the knowledge of God and His will. That's what you're supposed to do. So when, when you become dismissive of doctrine, you, you betray the ignorance of both God and His will. Who do you think gave us right doctrine? It was God. And it wasn't for no reason whatsoever. What do you think the, stu- what do you think the word theology means? It means the study of what? Of God. The study of God. You see, your beliefs determine your behavior. Your theology determines your ethics. Your doctrine determines what you do. And so for the people that just want to be told what to do and don't care to believe anything, I really don't know what to tell you. You must believe, and then that will form the basis of your actions. Every true and right doctrine from God impacts how we live as believers. And God has not told us the answer to every question in His Word, but He has told us what we need to know. Over a week ago, I went to visit Ruth McCommon. Many of you know Ruth, and some of you may not. She's a godly, wonderful lady who's late in life. And uh, she is uh, going blind in the one eye that she uh, currently has. Uh, and, and she just lost her daughter uh, a few weeks ago. And she called me and asked me to visit, and I went out to visit her. And we had a wonderful visit. In the midst of the visit, she told me a story about when she lived in Hawaii. She was at a church there, and a family came, and they had a four-year-old, and the family mom or the grandmother told Ruth, if you can answer our four-year-old's question, we will keep coming to your church. So the pressure's on, right? She said, what's the question? The four-year-old said, where did God come from? Ruth thought about it for a minute. And she said, you see this book here? This book tells us everything that God wants us to know about him. And it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ruth said, all we know is that at the very beginning of time, at the very beginning of creation, God was already there. Everything that we need to know about God is in this book. That family came back the next week and is still coming to church many years later. God gave Ruth an answer to an unanswerable question. A question that's beyond the scope of any of us, beyond the scope certainly of a four-year-old. But you see, Ruth has, in her heart and in her mind, an unquestioning belief in the sufficiency of her faith. The sufficiency of God's Word. The sufficiency of Christ. Every true and right doctrine impacts how we live as believers. You see, when you and I start to hunger and thirst after God, like a deer pants for water, when you learn to desire God's Word as if it were a treasure, then God will provide you the power that you need to live your life well. In verses 11 and 12, we read, "...being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience." joyfully giving strength to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saint's inheritance and the light. Listen, you do not need to listen to other groups, other religions, 
other cults, anyone else who promises you that you will gain some type of secret knowledge or you'll gain some type of special status. Why? Because you already, as a Christian, have the knowledge of the eternal God. You have the status of being His child. And if you expect me to believe that some man-made organization or some coven of witches and warlocks can grant you a status greater than the status that the Most High God in Christ has granted you, you're crazy. God has given you everything that you need for life and godliness. So we give thanks to the Father. As verse 12 says, He's enabled us to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. You see, way back in ancient days, God promised the nation of Israel, His chosen people, that they would receive an inheritance, a portion of the promised land, which God had promised to all of His people. And each tribe would receive a different portion. And likewise now, God is preparing you to receive your portion of the inheritance that He has prepared for all of His children. And the only way for you to become fit to receive the inheritance that God has prepared for you is to live in Christ. So all of the clubs and all of the cults and all of the councils of the world cannot prepare you to receive the inheritance that God has in store for you. There are no truthless teachings, no fake philosophies, no novel knowledge, no withheld wisdom, no secret ceremonies, and no esoteric experiences that are of any benefit to you as a Christian. Look at what Christ Jesus has done for you. In verse 13, we read, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul is telling all of those Colossians that he, by the way, did not convert. He's telling all of them, remember back to when you got saved. Do you remember that? Do you remember when you were converted to Christ? When God transferred you from the kingdom of darkness and placed you into the kingdom of the Son that He loves? Do you remember that time? It might have been a long time ago. And maybe for some of us, our memory has faded over the years. But regardless of not whether you remember your conversion, I want you to think about what Jesus Christ has done for you. And whether or not you thought of it in these terms at the time, Jesus transferred you. He delivered you from darkness and He brought you into the light. That means that the powers of darkness no longer have sway over you. And You might wonder, well, if you know, I'm a Christian. If the powers of darkness don't have sway over me, then why do I still sin? Why do I sometimes mess up and give in to temptation if the powers of darkness have no sway over me? Listen to me. When Christ died on the cross, He overcame all of the powers, all of the spiritual principalities that lead us to sin and lead us to suffer its effects. That does not mean that those powers and principalities have no power anymore. They do. They're just living on borrowed time. Their doom is sealed. You see, for you, Christian, spiritual powers and principalities only have power over you when you allow them to. You don't have to allow them to. Because now we have been transferred from the kingdom or the realm of darkness and sin and death into a new kingdom, the kingdom where Christ is Lord. The powers that lead you to sin are not Lord over you. And if you think as a Christian, well, I just, I just can't overcome this, 
then you are believing a lie. Christ is Lord over you. And when we dwell spiritually in the kingdom of the Son, then we can begin to experience the full life, the overcoming life that Christ has prepared for us. And also what we've received as residents of the kingdom of Christ is redemption. Redemption is a wonderful term. What does redemption mean? Well, redemption, Paul describes it. He says it's the forgiveness of sins. In ancient days, if a person was taken captive because of a war, or a person was taken captive and he was made a slave, and then later that person was released, later that person was purchased from slavery, was brought back to his own kingdom, that person would be delivered and that person would be, it was said of that person that that person was redeemed. There was always a cost to redeem a person held in captivity. The cost might be the cost of war. The cost might be a, a financial cost, but there was always a cost. Well, the same is true of us spiritually. Each one of us, because of sin, has been taken captive by the evil one. But because of Christ, he redeemed us. And Jesus paid a great cost in order to redeem us. He paid the cost of his own life. And what redemption means for you and me is that we now can experience the forgiveness of sins. You see, the only way that you can have the forgiveness of God for your sins is through the death of Jesus Christ. It is not through pious actions, and gaining more and more uh, good works to your account. That will not do it. It is only through the death of Jesus Christ. You must have faith in Christ and Christ alone. There's nothing that anyone else can do for you that will pay for your sins. And no act of piety can gain God's favor. If you want power over your sin. If you want the guilt of your sin to be fully washed away, you must have faith in Christ and in Him alone. 